That's interesting. Apparently we have a special guest today. <laughs> Philo Barnhart! From the secret of Nim Review! Who? He, he tried to eat us, remember? That's oddly not specific. It doesn't matter! We're not gonna let you dine on us again, Philo! Oh, that's a studio, Philo Barnhart. I'm a house, Philo Barnhart. What does a house Philo Barnhart do? Suck our blood? Or build furniture from our bones? No, I draw pictures of puppies. Oh my god, a puppy! I want a drawing of a puppy! We shall all have drawings of puppies! Wait, it's a trick! Remember, he hissed at us earlier! Well, that's how Philo's say hello! Getting saliva on my face? There are weirder traditions. I don't think there are. Come on, he draws puppies. Maybe this one's different. <sighs> I guess we are reviewing The Little Mermaid. Didn't he help design Ariel? <sighs> Alright, I'll allow it because it's reviewingly convenient. But if I see teeth marks anywhere... Does that include the wall? I really don't want him here, guys. No, Come we're on. doing this! Yes, we we are are puppies. Puppies. I don't know how he's doing this. Okay, fight! Fight! fight. He can stay! But you better have stories. And you better have room for more drawings of puppies. I do! I always have room for that! Like a moth to the lame. <laughs> With it almost being 35 years since the release of the original and the live action remake having us all say, okay, okay, give it a chance, but it's probably gonna be dookie. It only makes sense to talk about the film that starred the Disney Renaissance. The Little Mermaid came out when Disney was in a real rough bind, with films taking increasingly longer to make and getting very little box office return. But with new management taking over, it was said that Disney would have a new anime film of high quality every year. It seemed unlikely, but with The Little Mermaid being both an artistic and box office darling, maybe it wasn't so far-fetched. Audiences were blown away by the music, animation, and updated storytelling of the traditional Disney formula. But let's be honest, it's over 30 years later and cinema does continue to change. Is it still as timeless as when it first came out? We all have nostalgia, but does it objectively work on its own, even if you didn't grow up with it? Well, we're gonna take a closer look. And helping me out like in the past is one of the film's animators, Philo Barnhart! Aha! I knew it! I knew you were trying to eat us! Oh, thanks for holding onto my prop hand while I tie my shoe, Philo. No problem. You just walk around with a prop hand. Yeah. There. This is The Little Mermaid. Avast! Early CGI off the port bow! And it weirdly doesn't look that bad. Yeah, everyone thinks Beauty and the Beast was the first 2D movie to use CG, but Disney did use it a couple times in the past. The difference is they didn't always know if it was going to render correctly, so they always kept it half hidden just in case. Even Beauty and the Beast had a backup plan to have the ballroom hidden with just a spotlight on them in case it didn't render. Weird. Isn't this great? The salty sea air, the wind blowing in your oh. face. Oh, it's a beautiful day to Aladdin. Hey, why aren't you all Aladdin-ing? That's better. This is Prince Eric, voiced by Christopher Daniel Barnes. Hell yeah, great Brady played royalty. <laughs> Who's listening to rumors of mer people under the ocean. Mer people. Down in the depths of the ocean they live. On. And they're white. Mer people and baby Jesus are always white. <laughs> Take in that air. Under water. Yeah, how's this work? Of course, mer people do exist, and they swim towards their palace of dicks where King Triton lives. Voiced by Kenneth Mars. I'll be honest, I did not know he voiced him all these years, and I half expect him to be showing up to a production of Springtime for you know who. I'm really looking forward to this performance, Sebastian. He's actually watching a concert of his daughters orchestrated by Sebastian. Voiced by Samuel E. Wright. One daughter seems to be missing, though. Ariel! Wow, that dude's eyes literally turned red. Is there a T-800 endofish skeleton under there? Turns out she's off exploring what's left of the Pirates franchise with her pal, Flounder. Have you ever seen anything so wonderful in your entire life? Wow, cool. We started working on her with Dan Haskett. When Glenn Keane joined us on designing the character, he suggested, hey Philo, um, are you familiar with the films of Miyazaki? And I said, I certainly am. He says, what, what if we did our own version of an anime girl character? I said, oh, that's intriguing, you know, because they have the little traditional triangular face, you know, with the little pointy chin and the big eyes with like, they have a million highlights in them. <laughs> and we took pity on the animators. We only got one highlight down from like three that we started with. She was in part based on what we thought a Disney-fied anime girl would look like. I had a personal favorite that I used as my inspiration in that 
was uh, French actress Emmanuelle Barrett. She has that long, elegant neck that I'm after and the wide-spaced eyes, beautiful big eyes. We got the hair uh, somewhat from Christy Brinkley and also from uh, Christina Applegate. She used to uh, have her hair styled out it was like this little shelf. They initially wanted a blonde, but the rest of us said, no, let's do a redhead. We've never had a, a redhead star before. Plus, it was going to look great with the uh, underwater colors. You're not getting cold fins now, are you? Ariel is voiced by Jody Benson, modeled after Alyssa Milano. But I'll be honest, I mostly see Sherry Stoner, who is the live-action reference. So much of what I remember about the character comes from her expressiveness and comedic reactions, which added a new dimension to her compared to past Disney women who were seen as more passive. Even former Disney animators said they were amazed how expressive the character was, as when they animated women, they were encouraged to keep them more composed and proper. Sherry did uh, a, an amazing job. We are inventive as animators, but uh, a lot of people don't study acting, and they, they really need to be an actor with a pencil. That's something Don Bruth always told us. And here we had an improvisational actress that was very demure and about Ariel's size. Glenn used her quite a bit in his song sequence, Part of Your World, while she was on a like an office chair on wheels and they would spin her around and <laughs> make her glide around and they would swing the camera around her and, and that all made it into the film. I will say though, it does make me kind of want to hear Slappy Squirrel's voice come out for every once in a while. You really think there might be sharks around here? Sounds like a standard cartoon plot to me. Yeah, yeah. You remind me of a bad accident at Benny Hanna's. Can you believe I'm doing this for scale? <laughs> what a yutz. How you doing, kid? They check in with a seagull named Scuttle. I hear Buddy Hackett's very good in this. Who tries to explain what they found. It's a dingle hopper to straighten their hair out. Humans go nuts <laughs> over. Scuttle is the cable news of information. Music! Uh, Ariel remembers that she missed the concert, she does the meme thing, and we see she's being watched by the sea witch Ursula, played by Pat Carroll. She may be the key to Triton's undoing. Half the kids in the audience are like, why do I know what tentacle hentai is now? Actually, I started with Ursula. That was with Rob Minkoff, and we did a series of um, rough tests of her, and I went to ask the receptionist a question. I said, D.I., you're Pat Carroll. <laughs> there she was sitting on the sofa. And she says, why, yes, I am. Who are you? I said, my name is Philo Barnard, and I'm doing you. I mean, I'm working on you. I mean, I'm working on Ursula. And she laughed and says, then you come over here and you tell me all about it. She says, would it help you if I gave you my take on her? And I said, that would be a great gift. She says, well, don't laugh, but I, I see her as this great Shakespearean actress who retired under the sea for some reason. I said, OK. So just like in the song, it's body histrionics and not vocal, and she says, exactly. Ariel talks to her father, who is not only angry she missed the concert, but also that she went to the surface. Do you think I want to see my youngest daughter snared by some fish eater's hook? I'm 16 years old. I don't eat off hooks anymore. That was what? It was a long time ago. He forbids her from going to the human world and tells Sebastian to keep an eye on her. Sebastian follows her to Bit Bath and Below, where he discovers she's a collectomaniac, an absolute hoarder for human things. Which I guess technically a hoarder is too. Yeah, I don't know why I phrased it that way. Wouldn't you think I'm the girl, the girl who has everything? And it probably goes without saying, but this entire song sequence is basic perfection. Really, when people think of great moments in Disney animation, this is usually near the top of the list. Jody was having trouble getting into the mood for a part of your world. If anyone's ever tried to sing it out there, you know what I mean. It's it's a hard song to tackle. But she wanted to feel like she was Ariel in a dark cavern, so they lowered the lights in the studio. I want to be where the people are. Glenn handled that whole sequence on his own, which was his baby from the ground up. He storyboarded it, rough animated it, had it cleaned up with his own crew. He actually developed carpal tunnel syndrome in his drawing hand. I'm pretty sure Glenn lost more hair on that, on that sequence. <laughs> she almost didn't make it into the film. <laughs> Jeffrey Katzenberg had attended a preview audience, saw some kids fidgeting during the song, and it was still mostly in storyboard form at that point. So he got nervous and said, it's out out and uh, a big battle began <laughs> between Glenn Keane, Howard Ashman and uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg and it stayed in. It's a tenet of a musical theater that 
there should be a, some kind of song of yearning, and, and that was Ariel's, was part of your world. But for some reason on Blu-ray, they switched these two clips around. Watch. Who wish I could be a part of that? Who wish I could be a part of that? Do you know why they did that? I don't know why they did that. Oh my god! Aha! I knew he would attack us! No, I mean, oh my god, he drew me as a princess! And he drew me as a tiger! <laughs> oh, well, did you draw one of me? I certainly did. Wow. I'm gonna hang mine in my bedroom. I'm gonna hang mine in my den. I'm gonna throw up. Ariel sees a ship in the distance and is instantly drawn to it. She takes a closer look, gets licked by the dog, rubs the slobber off the wrong cheek, and goes little scent maid on Eric. He's very handsome, isn't he? I don't know, he looks kind of hairy and slobbery to me. Not that one. Not until message boards are a thing anyway. They reveal a statue of Eric, which I swear is a Trump NFT, when suddenly a storm hits. This is one of those sequences where the shots go by really fast, but if you pause certain moments, you really get some amazing compositions. We started going back uh, to use some techniques that were tried and true. Multiplane shots for uh, waves. Each one of those clusters of waves, they develop patterns, just like we have to develop formulas for drawing the characters. Pieces coming off of other pieces of water. This was the last film that was painted by hand. Um, the very next one was, was uh, uh, digitally uh, colored. One or two airbrush cells that flash over the main animation. Sometimes it's even a white grease pencil right on the celluloid. Ariel saves the prince and brings him to shore. Is he dead? Oh, I, I can't make out a heartbeat. Yeah, who brought Dr. Tarantino here? The prince survives, though, and hears Ariel singing just before he can get a good look at her. A girl rescued me. She, she had the most beautiful voice. And she smelled like brown trout? Ariel obsesses over Eric, and I do mean obsesses, thinking she's discovered the love of her life. He loves me not. He loves me. Oh, I knew it! Flower science never lies! Gotta see him again. Tonight. Scuttle knows where he lives. I'll chain him to my bed, borrow that sledgehammer so I can change his feet into proper fins. Yeah, so this is probably a good time to bring up what many people consider either the best part of the movie or the worst part of the movie, The Little Mermaid herself. I'll be honest, I really like the original Hans Christian Andersen story. Like Romeo and Juliet, you can kind of see it in two ways. You can see it as true love at first sight that ends in tragedy, or impulse attraction that's not allowed to play out, resulting in sacrifice. You could argue this film completely goes against the original idea of the story. But what it's transformed into is still pretty good. Traditionally, Disney has always brightened up these stories because uh, actually they're pretty damn dark. <laughs> Pinocchio is one of the darkest. I got really concerned all of a sudden and I went into John Musker and I said, what are you going to do for the end? I just realized. He says, oh, don't worry, she lives. It's a Disney film. We can do that, right? <laughs> Disney's good about, um, you know, giving you a relief every so often <laughs> and making it hopeful. What makes this one interesting, though, is that it's in between something like Snow White and something like Frozen. Snow White is 100% emotional storytelling. Who is this guy? What is his name? Why do they just have an understanding she has to go with him now? There's no sense at all, but it's a fairy tale where logic takes a back seat and gives your emotions what they want to see. It's closer to how a dream works rather than reality. And that is a very respectable form of art and storytelling. Frozen has a lot more logic to it. You can't marry someone you just met, and comedy ensues. Both work well because that's the environment they created. The dialogue from either of these movies wouldn't fit in the other. You couldn't hear Snow White saying, Foot size doesn't matter. But you also couldn't hear Elsa saying, Let's scoop up the water and rub it on your face and go... <laughs> Little Mermaid clearly wants the simplicity and emotions of Snow White, but they evolve the character closer to something like Frozen. Ultimately, we wanted to make a, a, a traditional, you know, animated musical fairy tale. We champion at the bit to do that. We did take a little of the past and, and put it in her character. A lot of people yell at Ariel for being too man-obsessed, but at the time, she was seen as a pioneer because she was actually going after what she wanted. 
the character is active. She's mm -hmm. not just a little girl that things happen to. She's up there. She's going to go to the surface. She's going to find her prince. She's going to take care of business. And so you can really identify with it. Bottom line, they did their job too well in making her feel more real. So instead of coming across as a wide-eyed innocent in a dreamlike world where instant romance is welcomed, she comes across a little bit more like a stalker. Run away with you? <laughs> this is all so, so sudden. Let's learn some Japanese today, kids. And let's give credit, the prince isn't much better. I'm gonna find that girl. And I'm gonna marry her. Because she held my hand and that means we get married, right? We get married? Thankfully, though, everything else about her is so engaging and likable. She doesn't have much of an arc, but I realize she's helping other people achieve their arcs of not seeing the surface world as evil. For the few flaws the character has, which you could connect to just the fairy tale landscape of the time, there's way too many things about her that reflect the excitement of following our passions despite the world telling us not to. Her supporting cast plays a big part in that, too, as Sebastian sings the song that everybody loves and yes, I acknowledge is good, but... I always just saw as the song before Poor Unfortunate Souls. Sorry, villain songs are still the best in Disney flicks. Under the sea. Under the sea. Our producer Maureen Donnelly found a wonderful dance troupe in Los Angeles, the Lula Washington Dance Theater. Very improvisational, just like uh, the, the people we had acting out on a video for us, where a lot of the moves of those characters came from, especially that turtle that's that's on the rock and, and the chorus lines of the fish and everything. Can I put 2023 Disney and 89 Disney in a room just to see what they talk about? Tell them I'll be back after happy hour. I've got an urgent message from the Sea King. He knows. Sebastian accidentally lets it slip that Ariel is in love with a human and he takes Triton to her hiding spot where Flounder brought the prince's statue. How the hell did he drag that there all by himself? Dad! Is it true you rescued a human from drowning? You don't even know him. You don't either! Triton destroys her collection with some really cool lighting effects, which completely tears Ariel apart. <laughs> anyway, dinner's at five. Now to talk to your other sister about her report card. An A minus? <laughs> These two seem trustworthy. If only there was something we could do. But there is something. Why this scene so sums up the movie, we're gonna put it as the cover of the Nintendo game. No, really, they did that. Very random. Ursula has great powers. I know the effects department was happy because we were trying to figure out a way to show underwater current. Short of animating hundreds more bubbles, we had decided to have the hair long enough so that it would wave in the current. And <laughs> the sea witch? They say Ursula can help, so she agrees to follow them to her. No, she's a demon! She's a monster! Why don't you go tell my father? You're good at that. In hindsight, yes, he probably should have done that. Again, all this looks very inviting. This thing looks like it's shagging up with the tiger's head from Aladdin. Come in. Come in, my child. Ursula says she can turn Ariel human, but she has to give up her voice and has only three days to win him over, or she'll belong to her. Life's full of tough choices, isn't it? <laughs> I've talked about Pat Carroll's amazing work in a previous video, so I won't repeat myself. With that said, though, I think most people can agree this is her at her most iconic. And by God, like I said, this song's still so freaking cool. Not only is the music amazing, but every other pose I could see on a heavy metal poster. This whole sequence kicks so much ass! You know, I never heard anything about Divine being an inspiration for the character. Uh, we did have a man play the part for us, and sadly he was left off the credits. Max Kirby, since he had been at the very early stages of production, they forgot all about him. He uh, was Rob Minkoff's friend, and we hired him for a weekend, and he came in. Like Sherry, he was very good at improvisation. He inspired, on the whole, I've been a saint to those poor unfortunate souls, because that was what we were doing. We were shooting him, uh, primarily doing the song. Keep singing! I also love how creatively they show her voice being taken. That's a very abstract idea when you really think about it, but they find a pretty inventive way to show it. She turns her human, Ariel drowns, and the movie's over. So Philo, how are you? 
I knew it! I knew it! God damn it! You're eating us! You're eating us! Critic, can you keep it down? Yeah, finally showing us his life-size mermaid skeleton. Okay, why? Why? Why would you just randomly carry the skeleton of a mermaid? Answer me that! Answer me that! Do you really think I wouldn't? I need a break from this. Sebastian and Flounder get Ariel to the surface where Eric's dog finds her. What's gotten into you, Bella? Oh. Oh, I see. Now could you maybe find the king or queen of this kingdom? Who are my folks supposed to be in this? They didn't even come to the wedding! As mentioned before though, she can't explain who she is. What is it? You can't speak? Then you couldn't be who I thought. Ah, uh, Shane, their handwriting isn't the same so she could write it down. Didn't she sign her name in English? Don't worry. Don't worry, I'll help you. We had a problem with that hair too uh, once she was out of the water because people forgot, you know, it, it does dry and settle. <laughs> it, you know, hangs limp. So a lot of people forgot that and they still kept the shape. <laughs> I think it's a testament to the animators that even without her voice, this is still a hugely expressive character. Hell, maybe even more so without it. These reactions when she combs her hair with a fork have almost no movement, but the timing, editing, and little that they do animate make it one of the funniest moments in any Disney film. I am not even kidding. As a kid, I rewound this scene so many times, it started to scratch the tape. Which is weird. All my friends had this scene scratched up for some reason. <laughs> There's also some good comedy with Sebastian fighting off a chef, played by Rene Aubenjamois. First I cut off their heads and I pull out their bones and I kill them in two. <laughs> oh, this would definitely get a PG now. Not because it's violent, but just because it, you know, exists. I will clean your chronometers. I don't know what's funnier, this bit of slapstick, or suddenly noticing Prince Philip and Princess Aurora as Chef Boyardee noodles. What the hell is that? Ariel gets a tour of Eric's kingdom, again resulting in some charming comedy and more expressive reactions. We decided to set up a training session between Glen Keane, Bill Berg, and myself. We each had an hour to train people on how we put the character together. A lot of people swallowed hard because they don't like drawing uh, humans. Your audience knows how people should look and behave. They were terrified of failing, so we tried to get them over that hurdle by having that session. Using ball shapes, and cross hatches, and uh, imaginary masks that eventually you'll remove so that the character's head can be tilted around and turned side to side and you can actually build the eyes in there, build their eyebrows over the mask. Ah, <sighs> mermaid drivers. We get another classic song with Sebastian trying to convince Eric to kiss her. You dying to try you on a kiss again. Did, did you hear something? Despite this couple not having a ton of time together, the time they do have does create some good chemistry. They work well together. Mildred. <laughs> okay, no. Rachel? Ariel. Her name is Ariel. Ariel with two H's? But I got to know Howard rather well. In fact, his birthday is the day after mine. We actually did celebrate our birthdays a couple of times during production. The Broadway show picked up a lot of the things we had to drop for the movie, including the fact that Ariel was Ursula's niece. A lot of the songs they were considering, uh, Daddy's Little Angel, ended up in the Broadway show. Bo tips over, though, as Ursula realizes she has to take matters into her own hands. She uses Ariel's voice to transform herself, resulting in a pretty creepy little scene. Oh god, I suddenly think the sequels are good now! A twin sister, of course Ursula had that! Eric is hypnotized to marry the doppelganger, saying she was the one who saved him, thus breaking Ariel's heart. And I'll just say it, as a kid, I thought evil Ariel was a little hotter. Seriously, I can see why this minister got a heart on. Oh, that's not in this version. Oh, I see you can build a castle out of him, but this is going too far. That is not what people think it is. That is his knee. My friend Will Finn animated that. The problem I have is they didn't spend enough time showing that he's very diminutive. He's even tinier than Ariel. He's actually standing on a platform. His vestments go past his knees, so it looked to some people like he was getting aroused, I guess. But I, I know for a fact that he wouldn't never have done that. Now the phallus on the palace. That, that was really there. Don't worry, Aliel. There's plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't finish it. 
Scuttle sees that it's Ursula in disguise and lets our heroes know. They swim to the ship while Scuttle gets an army ready to attack. <laughs> Were there no sharks he could ask to help? All oh, right, they were helping sink another ship. The scene is pretty funny, and you could argue started the Disney tradition of funny climax first, serious climax second. Aw, oh, she comes with a voice? Deals off, I'm not on board for that. They're too late though, as she's turned back into a mermaid, which always made me wonder, where'd the underwear go? Is it just inside the tail now? Okay, I thought too hard about this. Not in that way. And King Triton comes to save her. We made a deal. You will please be unconscious. <laughs> but it looks like the contract is literally unbreakable. This is how Disney lawyers think actual reality works. And he hands over his life for hers. <laughs> Monster! Contract a knob! <laughs> how the hell did he throw that so fast underwater? I'd be like... <laughs> Eric gets caught, but Ariel saves him again, resulting in Ursula altering her shape. Oh, Eric, you are happy to see me. I mean, oh no! To my power! I'll admit, I usually see villains turning big as kinda lame. Like, it doesn't seem that creative, but this climax is pretty epic. I don't know, maybe because it's a person and a squid and she's using magic, they added a few things to make this feel appropriately unique and badass. She brings up. The ship from Frozen, I guess? I can't remember the conspiracy theories. And Eric climbs aboard, finally for once, saving her. Yeah, the scoreboard's a little bit in her favor, buddy. The sea shouts, Hail Ariel, the wicked witch is dead. And seeing how Eric saved her, Triton finally sees that humans aren't evil and turns her into a human to be with Eric. They get married with Ariel doing her best impression of the dog. Yeah, I never knew it was up with that face. And it looks like the chef has unfinished business with Sebastian. <laughs> Hey, where'd all the people on the ship go? Yeah, maybe they were like, look, we showed up for half a wedding for half an area. We're only staying for half on this one. Now we can run. Now we can your Majesty, would you care to join us in eating your slaughtered brethren? Enough with the singing already. And that was The Little Mermaid. It has a few flaws, but overall, I think it really holds up. I personally like other Disney animated films better, but man, did this get the ball rolling for a lot of future masterpieces to get made. And more than raised the bar for what was expected from Disney and animated films in general. The few problems it has are more than overshadowed by what works about it. The characters, the visuals, the music, this really was a game changer after a long slog of underwhelming material from the masters of animation. We actually had more time to make Secret of Nim than we got on Mermaid. Most people had to get it done in 18 months, which is a year and a half, and that was unheard of. Disney had always given his artists three and four years to make a movie, and that's really what it took. They didn't have the tools that we have now. Videotape machines to do a, tape our own video tests, the advent of the computer tools that we use. That made it a little easier, but they had to hire an awful lot more people. We were spending morning, noon, and night in there. <laughs> they were feeding us meals to keep us there, and the overtime was great. <laughs> this put Disney back on the map and got everyone rethinking how to tell an animated fairy tale. An art that's evolved even more since then, and hopefully will continue to evolve. And not de-evolve. Is it the original story? No. Is it the most complex of the Disney movies? No. But there is an admirable simplicity that's clearly trying to grow and find its footing. We also knew that if we didn't meet this mandate of the studios, that they would shut down the department. And that was the foundation of the studio to begin with. That was worth preserving, so we worked extra hard. We also knew that it was probably going to be a hit because it was bringing back the traditional type of movie they always were successful at. It could have been the end, and instead uh, it, it opened the pathway for all the other great movies that came along after. What else can you say, but there's a reason both children and adults still watch this film over 30 years later. And a big thank you once again to Philo Barnhart. You said it. Philo, you are so much nicer than Studio Philo. Yeah, thanks for not eating us, man. Well, actually, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, that saliva I spat on you is full of venom. And this is all a shared hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
Now that's comedy. It's Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month, so for Cameos for Charity, we're doing the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This is the world's leader in the search for a cure for cystic fibrosis and supports a broad range of research initiatives to tackle the disease from all angles. So if you want a cameo from me saying happy birthday, good luck, or whatever, click on the link in the description and be giving to a good cause. If you're like your face is ass and I hate you, well, consider giving to this charity anyway, because it's full of good people doing great work. Check them out and see what you can do to help out.